Oh, thank you. Let me start by thanking the organizers for this putting together this great event and you all for being part of it. I'm, be, I'm enjoying myself and learning a lot in these three days. So uh, if you fight with me against uh, post-lunch sleepiness for a little while, I'd like to talk about the moral responsibility of artists and designers, which I am aware is not a topic that connects directly with fiction, but still in these past three days, uh, uh, lots of related topics kind of were uh, uh, pointed out. And I hope to, that uh, some of you will be able to see the connection to what they, uh, you were saying. So let's jump right into it. And uh, for me, the entry point to this issue was the increasing realization uh, of the extent to which daily objects and spaces shape our mind and agency. Indeed, we will be hard pressed to find an instance of, of a thought or action that is not uh, enabled or influenced in any way by the rich world of material objects that we humans surround us uh, with things like uh, ob um, tools of, uh, of any kind, possible kind, spaces, architectural spaces, uh, environmental uh, designs, but also increasingly uh, virtual designs and user interfaces of, 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 some, of any sort. And uh, these, kind of, these objects uh, enable uh, our thought and actions, uh, but they also constrain us uh, in several ways, in the sense that they uh, uh, encourage certain kinds of, of uh, cognitive activity and behavior and discourage others. And that's perhaps their, their tyrannical side, their, their coercive aspect that uh, can be worrying. And indeed, artists, designers, architects, engineers, digital designers can be thought as engineers of the human soul. And uh, this rather flourished expressions, it's not mine, but it's uh, from Stalin, actually. The, <laughs> Uh, used to think that artists were had that role in society. So from this uh, uh, quote already, we should probably pay the highest critical scrutiny to the kind of human engineering that objects carried out. And um, so that's the, the aim of the talk, really, uh, to uh, think about the ethical and also aesthetic implications of this work of human engineering carried out by objects. So the plan for the talk will be pretty straightforward. There will be four paths. In the first one, I, I will offer some theor theoretical background to understand the influence that objects have on us and that we have on them. In the second part, I will uh, sketch this uh, moral dilemma that I think is always involved in the activity of designers and artists. In the third section, I will uh, offer a way out of this dilemma, a possible way out, which is based on um, um, on aesthetic thinking. And in the fourth part, I will try to draw uh, some broader conclusions on the relationship between ethics and aesthetics based on, on, this, uh, on, on the above points. So let's start by uh, thinking a little bit theoretically about how objects shape and influence us. So here's a, a particularly a nice example of this. Uh, if you haven't seen this picture before, it will probably look like a, white, uh, a random array of white and, and black patches. But if I tell you that there is an, an object there, an animal, and more specifically a cow, perhaps you can see that. And if you don't, here's some cues. Here are some cues. So you just see the face of the cow in this picture. And here's the nose. Those are the eyes. And these are the ears of the cow. So probably now you see it. But interest, the interesting bit is what you did in this relatively unproblematic operation, which is that uh, at the same time you determine the shape or your percepts, you arrange your, your visual array uh, in a way that made sense. And at the same time, you determine yourself in a sense that you become the kind of creature that sees a cow in that visual array. So it's like you had, at the beginning, you had uh, a, a, a multiplicity of interpretive possibilities and uh, then, then actualized in, 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 a, in a specific interpretation of it. And in doing so, you both uh, determined the kind of vis visual person that you were facing and the kind of creature that you were, that you are. And, and it would be difficult at this point to unsee 
the cow and, and to see that visual array as something else. So you have changed as a, as a result of that experience. But the same process goes on on a different time scale in learning, because in learning, indeed, the stimuli that we encounter determine the kind of creature that we become. At the same time, you determine the stimuli that you encounter. For example, if you play the violin long enough, uh, your uh, motor cortex will thicken in particular places uh, and you will uh, start changing the way you interact with that object. But at the same time, it's you that determine which kind of, uh, if you're playing an instrument at all, or which kind of instrument are you playing. So uh, to put it with uh, this quote from Merleau-Ponty, uh, this phenomenology of perception, uh, that, uh, that shows particularly well this kind of circular causality where, whereby the, the agent is causing uh, its perceptions and this perception are causing the agent. Uh, it can be said that the organism cannot properly be compared to a keyboard on which the external stimuli would play and in which the proper form would be delineated for the simple reason that the organism contributes to the construction of that form. The organism chooses uh, the stimuli in the physical world to which it will be sensitive, and this will be like a keyboard in which moves itself in such a way as to offer, and according to a variable rhythms, uh, such or such of its keys to the in itself monotonous action of the external hammer. So, again, you can, you can see there that there is sort of circular causation uh, involved in this process of, of learning, whereby the agent chooses the kind of stimuli uh, 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 she approaches and on the other hand, these stimuli cause the agent to behave in a certain way. But this is true also on a higher uh, temporal scale in evolution, because basically in evolution, the environment that the species inhabits determines the selective pressures that the species encounters, but the species uh, on its own determines the environment that it inhabits. So in, in the process called niche construction, it is uh, that particular species that in rearranging its environment is changing the selective pressure to which it is subject. And so it's directing in a way its developmental parable. So it's pretty clear that uh, at the level of perception, learning and evolution, uh, we are at the same time, the products and the producers of our material world in the sense that in structuring it, we structure ourselves at multiple temporal scales, or to put it really more succinctly, with McLuhan and Culkin, we shape our tool and thereafter our tool shape us. But now, an interesting question is, who is structuring her? Who? So who, who is the control in this process of, of mutual structuring? Who is, has the agency? Well, if you try to determine who in this operation as the control, I think you run into a lot of uh, paradoxes and um, dichotomies that are not easily solvable. For example, I mean, uh, idealism and realism can be characterized as uh, incarnating a debate over which, uh, uh, over whether the structures are really there in the environment or whether we are just projecting them. Uh, is the cow, for example, really in the picture or did, did you just create that? And um, I mean, the, the same opposition can be uh, found uh, underlying a, a, view, a certain Cartesian view of the mind according to which there is a stark division between mind and matter or a kind of extended mind position according to which our cognitive processing spreads in the environment and, and have material objects as, as they enabling condition as well. But also uh, we can uh, find it um, find this opposition in kind of uh, divide between a, a Kantian and the notion of agency, according to which agency just pertains the human uh, realm, and uh, what is called by anthropology sometimes material agency. So not the agency that we express uh, when we shape objects, but the uh, the agency the objects express while shaping us. And I don't think that these uh, dichotomies are, are solvable. Uh, perhaps the problem there is that we should adopt a processual ontology uh, uh, rather than the, the, the thinking about these things as, as entities with fixed properties. We should probably think about them as processes, perhaps running in parallel or perhaps just one process is a process happening. But I'll let you decide that. Uh, what interests me here is that the question of design. So all these objects there uh, are not uh, natural uh, things. They have been designed by someone. So enters 
the designer conveniently interpreted here by a white male, well-educated, <laughs> surely, surely with the, the, the best intentions. And uh, of course, the, the, these, um, these designer structures uh, the world produces an object that we, that we use, uh, but at the same time, it is, it is structured by, by, by the object in the sense that he reacts to the possibilities that the, the material world that he is manipulating offers to him. And so he, he cannot do just anything. He needs to, to, to stick to certain limits of the material he is managing. And at the same time, it's true that through the object that he creates, the, the, the designer structures the, the, the subject, and at the same time, the subject uh, structures uh, the designer because uh, the subject imposes on him uh, lots of constraints having to do with the, the possibilities uh, that, that the, 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 the subject currently has, the cognitive and, and, and possi uh, possibilities, the possibilities for action. But the thing is rendered more complicated by the fact that uh, uh, the designer is using tools uh, 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 and, and these tools are, have a, another designer. So you get the idea uh, that um, uh, our possibilities for action and thought are the result of uh, complex webs of interactions of, of mutual, mutual structurings between uh, a lot of objects and a lot of, of, of people. And, and we act in these networks um, and, and, and questions of agency and thought should be posed in this holistic perspective. Um, so let's summarize this part. Uh, we have uh, said that at several temporal scales, our material environment structures our mind and agency, while at the same time, we, with our minds and agency, structure our, our material environment. And our capacity to think and act depends on complex networks of such relations of mutual structuring that includes multiple agents and multiple material objects. But more important than who is structuring who perhaps is whether this structuring, the thinking, the acting uh, takes place or not, whether our material world en enables us to, to express our thought and actions or not. And this means also that behind the design of objects and places lacks the problem of how we preserve ourselves as thinking and freely acting creatures. So here's the, 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 the moral part of the story. So now let's try to, to, to define what's the, the designer's moral dilemma I, I'm thinking about. Uh, so uh, remember where we started, objects and spaces constrain our thought and action in the sense that they make us think and behave in certain determinate ways. And, but we should now recognize that um, the coercive action that objects have on us is not always the same. Some objects are more coercive than other objects. And uh, the clearer, generally, the clearer the structure of the object is, the more coercive the object is. For example, in the case of the cow, it, it was kind of uh, um, ambiguous at the beginning, but now it is pretty coercive. What, once you see the, the cow, you, you, it's difficult to unsee that. But another kind of visual array, it's uh, less. It's more open to interpretation, and, and so it, it's less coercive in, in that sense. But to go to uh, an example with cinema, for example, this is a. Uh, there are a few images from uh, a visual, uh, 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 an interesting uh, uh, video essay by Eric Faden, and these are two shots: one from uh, Hitchcock's North by Northwest, and the other by a film by Jacques Tati. And this is a night tracking experiment. So the, the circles, I'm, I'm not sure you can see them all, but the circles that point to uh, where the gaze of people is and the dimension of the circles points to how, how much time they spent in that particular location. So as you can see in the Ichiko case, people are more or less looking at the same portion of the, of the image. And, and, and as a result, all, all people more or less experience the, the same kind of, the same kind of, of movie. And if they rewatch it, uh, uh, they will experience more or less like the, the same kind of movie as a result, at least at this perceptual level. Uh, in the Tati case, instead, uh, the, the viewer is left uh, more open to explore the, the frame. And as a result, people experience the film uh, in different ways. Um, so as you can see here as well, 
there is difference in the coercive power that the objects can have, can have on us. And the same thing for material stuff like this mug. By, by the way, the, the one on the, on the right, uh, was from that series that Mariano mentioned, I think, uh, the other day, uh, by, uh, um, an open based architect called Katarina Camprani, uh, and this, the, who has made this series of uh, uncomfortable things. And as you can see, one object mandates a precise kind of an action, the other one uh, is more open and it, it needs you to rearrange your, your, your uh, actions in reaction to that. You can imagine other, other examples. Um, um, also, in like landscape design, uh, on the, in the picture on the on the left, you are kind of uh, you have preferential uh, preferential way, clear preferential ways to engage both visually and uh, actively uh, with that landscape. And in the other uh, case, things are much more open. So, given the coercive power of objects and spaces, how should designers behave? That's the question. That the problem of design. How do we design words that sustain and nourish our freedom of thought and action? <laughs> now, it seems to me that there are two options. Uh, one is to embrace coercion, that is to create objects that constrain our thought and action. And the other is to avoid coercion, creating objects that do not constrain thought and action. Well, let's uh, examine these uh, uh, options in turn. Let's say, uh, in, uh, begin with start with with, uh, with uh, em embrace coercion uh, hypothesis. In this case, we have a designer that uses definite procedures to make clearly structured objects, the structure that uses in definite ways. Uh, so, for example, if we take the example of the um, uh, the, the phone interface, uh, we should imagine a designer that. Uh, sets out to produce uh, a, 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 the interface for a phone. It makes it according to established principles because it wants users to be able to use that object easily. And so it's not really doing any structuring after a while because uh, after a while, it is, we, we have established what are the affordances that people know best. And the object in turn is not structuring uh, him and in creating an object which is pretty clear, the, he's not structuring the, the user anymore because the user already know how to use that. And the user is not structuring the object in the sense that it's not, uh, and, and it's not grasping its structure anymore because he knows it already. So uh, you can see this picture as uh, this part of the schema as a kind of representation of alienated labor, perhaps, and this part as a kind of representation of a an anesthetized perception in which you are not aware of, of, uh, of perceiving things, of having chosen to perceive things in a certain way or, uh, or acting deliberately uh, uh, in a certain way. So after a while, uh, you will understand that uh, agency and mind disappear from the picture, essentially, uh, because the whole process becomes tyrannical, mechanical, and alienating. Uh, but if we embrace the opposite, uh, option, we should probably think about creating percepts or, or, or things that, uh, do not coerce the, the, um, the perceiver in any way. And these will be percepts that are not structurable, inevitably, because the moment you structure it, you get coerced by the percept in a way or another. And so the, the, in order to make this unstructural person, perhaps uh, the, the designers uh, uh, need not to follow, should not follow any established rule because the moment in which you can establish the rule of his operation, uh, you are structured by, by that rule as well. And so in, in this case also, the, the, the designer is not structuring the object. The object is not structuring the designer. We are in, unable to structure the object and, and the object is unable to structure us to produce any uh, noticeable difference. And so uh, you will see that also in this case, mind and agency disappear, disappear from a picture. We are simply unable to react cognitively or, uh, with our actions to what we are uh, perceiving. So, uh, it seems that summing up on this designer's moral dilemma, uh, objects and spaces have the power to constrain our thought and actions. 
body reason designers and object of objects and space phases model uh, uh, they can either create objects and spaces that constrains us and they deprive and depriving us of uh, and themselves of mind and agency on they cre they can create objects and spaces that do not constrain us in any way but in this case too they deprive us and themselves of mind and agency so both options seem to be incompatible with the existence as, a, as a, uh, what, with our existence as thinking things and doubt with agency and so the questions remain of uh, how do we design words that sustains and nourish our freedom of thought and action and uh, I think there is a viable option that it's the one uh, that we normally adopt since we have agency and, uh, and, and we, we carry out cognitive processes, which is, uh, these are the two options that we already explored, which is this one, that is that the designer uses a procedure that is not determined in advance, but still determinable to create an object that is not structured in advance, but still structurable, for a subject that is not structured in advance, but structure herself in the encounter with the object. Right. So uh, it, this can be pretty uh, complicated to read, but so let's break it down to its components and see why uh, I call it the aesthetic st stance in particular. So uh, the designer uses a procedure that is not determined in advance, but still determinable. Well, this maps well with the definition of genius and creativity in the sense that we are told that artists are uh, and geniuses are those particular people that define the rule of their operations while operating. They don't use pre-existing rules in order to um, to carry out uh, their productive activity. To create an object that is not structural in advance, but still structurable. Here again, uh, it seems that these kind of objects in which we intuit the structure, uh, in which we don't, don't know that this already, but we are able to grasp it, are the structure, the, the kind of objects that we prefer aesthetically. There is a huge empirical literature kind of showing that there is an optimum of ambiguity that is aesthetically more pleasing. Uh, if the structure is too simple, you get bored. If the structure is too complex, you don't understand it, you don't grasp it. Um, it's percepts that have this optimum ambiguity in which you don't see the structure initially, but you then grasp it that, tend, that, that we tend to prefer. And also the, the last part, for a subject that is not structured in advance, but structures herself in the encounter with an object. Again, it seems that this maps well with our intuitions about aesthetic experiences, because after all, we are said that in aesthetic experiences, we don't start with a pre-existing view on how we should approach the object. We should instead approach the object on its own terms. And that's why we don't have rules for taste, uh, because uh, the objects uh, ask from us to be uh, comprehended uh, in a novel fashion. So that's why I think that this is the, an aesthetic stance. And so if we explore that again with this schema, we can see that in the, with an, an homage, of course, in the city we are, uh, for the city we are, uh, we can see that in this particular case, uh, just to, to, to take to the extreme kind of creativity I'm talking about, uh, the, um, the artist here uh, is not working with uh, pre-existing rules. It's creating it in the, in the, in the fullest sense. So it's structuring something, uh, it's creating a new structure, and this new st at the same time is reacting in, in novel uh, ways to the possibilities of, of the material world he's engaging with. Uh, at the same time, it creates a, a, an open structure, a structure that we are invited to, to grasp. Uh, and so that we are in invited to structure, and at the same time structures us and promotes new kinds of behaviors. And in this case, we are not kind of alienate, we as subjects experience this, uh, this uh, object. We are not alienating the artist in the sense that we are open enough to let him express something we are not used to. And, and at the same time, the artist is not kind of alienating it and objectifying us because it's treating us as creatures open to uh, new experiences and able to rearrange. So now how do we link finally these things to uh, the, the issue of ma mind and agency. Well, it seems that the aesthetic st stance that I have described is the only compatible 
with our existence and thinking things and doubt with the agency. But in, in the other cases, as we saw, the agency tends to disappear from the picture. Of course, it would be a matter of degree. You will be more or less in control or uh, cognitively aware of what you're doing uh, uh, in, in, in some cases, but because we see we have seen that objects can be more or less constraining. Um, if that's the case, behaving aesthetically means behaving in, with mind and agency. There is neither mechanically nor randomly. And uh, on the other, uh, the other way around, in the sense that uh, the, perhaps the objects that we prefer aesthetically are those that allows us to express uh, our freedom of thought and action in in a, in a particularly enhanced way, which is a Kantian view, nothing new here, perhaps. Um, but in the aesthetic stance, each element, as we've seen, uh, as we have seen, uh, behaves in such a way uh, that is uh, aesthetically uh, with mind and agency, because the designer creates with mind and agency an object that reflects the mind and agency and allows the mind and agency of the user to flourish at the same time the user behaves in, with mind and agency in the encounter with the object and sees it as a product of the mind and the agency of the designer. So the link with morality comes be because if we adopt, if adopting an aesthetic stance is the only uh, option compatible with our existence as thinking things and doubt with agency, then the aesthetic stance is also a moral stance. Uh, because after all, we want, we want people to be able to exercise, uh, the three, uh, the three possibilities of thought and action. And this is reminiscent, I think, of the Kantian categorical imperative to treat everyone as ends in themselves, as, as, uh, agents that need to, uh, autonomously determine the, the course of thought and action. Uh, indeed. I will, I will want to propose a, a slightly stronger thesis than that in the sense that perhaps the, the aesthetic stance is the only possible moral stance because, uh, after all, morality is only possible, arguably, in a world of thinking things and out with agency. That's why when things get automated in the use of objects, we tend to uh, um, soften the moral responsibility of people because we just say that they acted on some sort of automatic uh, reflex. Um, so behaving aesthetically means treating everyone uh, as a moral agent, while not behaving aesthetically means creating a world where morality is impossible. This leads to some interesting consequences, as I, uh, I, I want to say. For example, that aesthetic and moral value tend to coincide, and perhaps more being more creative is a moral duty. Uh, all these theses are very strongly expressed in order to cause debate, of course, but I think we are in the right direction to understand uh, the kind of relationship between aesthetic and ethical values. So to conclude, I just rehearse the reasoning that I've done uh, in these slides. Our starting point was that objects and spaces direct our mental development and constrain our action or precisely mind and agency happen in a complex networks of mutual relationships where different elements constraints and enables the action of the others. Mind and agency have material conditions. They are not fixed entities, but might be lost and gained depending on the kinds of world we build and inhabit. To build worlds that promote our mind and agency, we need to behave aesthetically this is both a prescriptive and a descriptive statement in the sense that to the, to the extent that we have uh, mind and agency, we are behaving in such a way. So behaving aesthetically means treating the other as having agency in mind. This is both an aesthetic stance and a moral stance, indeed perhaps the only possible moral stance. This means that aesthetic and moral imperatives coincide. And given the above, we should return probably to the image, initial image of the designer as the engineer of the human soul and think uh, about whether there is something tyrannical about that in light of what we said. And perhaps uh, the image of the uh, artist and designer as an engineer of human soul is compatible with human freedom because as a designer, uh, you are really a designer only if uh, you behave freely and thus uh, uh, encourage the same freedom in, the in, the, in, the, in your users. So that's it. Thank you for your attention.